Greetings, folks. I'm Guy Allen from Unique Cars Magazine. Mark, how are you? I'm good, thanks, good. Guy. How are you? Mark Higgins, of course. Here you go. Now, uh, welcome to Unique Cars Garage. What we're aiming to do with this is to grab a whole bunch of stuff that we've either done over time or we're currently doing or whatever that doesn't normally get a lot of airplay and stitch it together so you get some sort of idea of what goes on behind the scenes. Whether people are going to be thankful for this is another matter, but anyway, I'm sure you'll let us know one way or another. <laughs> okay. Right. So, here we have. We have a list which I very carefully put together um, of the things we'll be playing with this issue. So I have a very quick look at a, a, a stunning early pacer. We've also got a resto story on an E49 charger. And meanwhile, Mick, our workshop resident, I swear he lives there. He says he's got a house, I don't believe it. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, see, that was news to you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. Anyway, there always seems to be there. Mick's going to talk us through gaskets and why you shouldn't panic when it all like, goes pear-shaped. Yes. And uh, finally, we did a little story a while back, and I thought this was worth bringing back to the surface, which was a 2019 Mustang. Yes. But we've also got Joe Borg there from the Mustang Club. Yes. Uh, with his 67 convertible. Yeah, beautiful. And... Joe has a few interesting things to say. He does. All right, so here we go. Right, so where were we? Um, this is absolutely stunning. Yes. Okay, so owned by the Bond family. How is it? Have you noticed that this particularly, maybe I'm imagining it, but particularly with Chryslers, they tend to be Chrysler families. Yes, they yeah. do, don't they? They, they do, yes. <laughs> and there is not only generations who own Chryslers, but there are generations of Chryslers sitting in their backyard. Yes. There's a good story here. He found the windscreen when he was restoring this. Now, the bloke's uh, pushing 50, I think. Right. I hope he forgives me. I hope, I hope that's right. But anyway, he's pushing 50, and uh, he went to look for the windscreen, the rear windscreen he bought for another pacer he owned when he was 16. He, exactly, that's wow. a big call. And he rang Dad and said, Dad, go and have a look behind the chook house. I think there's a pacer screen in there. Sure enough, there yeah, it was, right. and that's the one in the car. Oh. You've got to love them, haven't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Big so, love to hear that. so have a look in the magazine for this story. Um, yes. I, just, I just love the effort these people go to. Mm -hmm. This bloke's a repeat offender with pacers, yes. very happily so. Yep. He says it's his last. I don't believe him, no. but he says it's his last for the time being because it's an ongoing project. Okay, I'm sure we'll see his name and a four-door one pop up in the future. Well, now here's the, here we go, families and Chryslers. The story we're about to show you now is about an E49 uh, restored out of Brisbane. And this has a hell of a story behind it. Dad bought one new. Right. And it got stolen. Now, can you imagine that? This is, in you know, Early 70s. Exactly. So the... The family's invested big time in this. An E49 charger, it's probably the price of a house or a good portion of it. Yeah, exactly. So this is yeah, the second biggest investment after the yeah, house. Yeah. Dad's finally, and Mum have finally got enough money together to pay, exactly, yeah, pay the for a nice, bright performance car, and some bastard <laughs> walks off with it. I mean, we can laugh now, but I bet they weren't laughing at the time. No. Anyway, the owner of the, uh, of the car we're about to look at uh, remembered this it was mixed feelings about it, obviously, but he bought one back. Decades later, he bought one back and built it up into what it is now. So, yeah. have a look at the story. This thing came on the market, and I uh, wasn't expecting it. Right. I wasn't expecting it. Now, I had a bit of a chat to my wife and said, what do you think? And she says, well, what's your view? And I said, oh, I've been wanting one of these ever since I was a kid, you know. And I said, it's well priced. Uh, what do you think? And she said, oh, well, you might as well. Yeah. So we bit the bullet, um, we bought it, and then we started the restoration process on it. So have you had any sort of relationship with chargers over the years? Yes, I have. Uh, when I was 12, uh, Dad bought one of these cars. Right. Um, in fact, it's almost the same, except for he had a vitamin C one. Okay. And I fell in love with that car, and we had it for six months. And it got stolen. Oh, no. And I remember I was broken hearted when I found out that yeah. it was stolen. Dad was too, but mm. I was too young to understand. Right. And uh, he never bought another muscle car after that. Oh, and is he that just right? bought normal sedans. Oh, no. Mm. Oh, mm. no wonder you missed it. Unfinished well, business there. Oh, well, yeah. So he actually went from this 
to an Alpha Sud. Oh, okay. It was a right 1.2 litre yeah, yeah. little yeah, buzz Talk about box. chalk and cheese. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And back in the day when we had this thing, uh, it was just phenomenal. Yeah. Like, I remember mum had to drive it. Right. Because this was the family car. Yeah. And she was very nervous because it was loud and brash. And I remember we used to go around the block with her. I'd get home from school. I'd go, come on, mum, let's practice driving. And we'd drive <laughs> around the block. <laughs> Uh, and it was yeah, it was amazing. It was good times. And ever since we had that car, my view was oh, I'd love to get another one. Yeah, yeah. But you know, family, getting married, yeah. work gets in the way. And then this thing just came up out of the blue. And and I've been collecting photos and reports and that, so I knew oh. enough about them right. to do something with them. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not a mechanic by trade. Yeah. And I've I'm pretty handy, but you know common sense handy so to speak and I got this and then made a few phone calls and found a couple of people got burnt along the way right. as everyone yeah. does when they do yeah. restorations yeah. but then ultimately I found uh, an amazing gentleman uh, by the name of, of Des uh, and he used to operate specialty paintworks down the Gold Coast okay and he was recommended from a friend for a friend right and I basically pulled the engine out of the car, yep. pulled the gearbox out, yep. and delivered it to him. Right. And he did everything. Right. Okay. So what you see today yep. is what he did. Right. Okay. And it was just phenomenal. He spent, um, like, it was with him for three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. The biggest issue was um, he actually had to close his shop halfway through the oh. restoration process. So I started to sweat bullets. Of course. What's going to happen? Are yeah, we going yeah. to get the car back? Because it was in a million pieces. Right. And um, he said to me, he said, Phil, if you trust me, I'll take it home and I'll finish it at home. Okay. And I didn't know what to do. Yeah, I really yeah, didn't. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. well, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. So I asked um, him to show me where he lives. I went and had a look. The place looked secure enough. Yeah. And I said, okay. Right. And to his credit, he finished it. Right. He ended up getting uh, a job yep. uh, at near the end of the process, so he was able to use a proper spray, spray booth. Yeah, So okay. he got back into the paint panel business. Yeah. And he finished it off for me, to his credit. Right. And, um, yeah, so this is what you see here before you today. Now, looking at the photos you sent me, it looked like a full-on job. Oh, abs it was every nut and bolt. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, it what, did it have much rust? That's what was one thing I couldn't really pick. No, actually, the car was, was quite sound. It okay. only had it had a bit of rust in the A-pillar on yeah. your side. Yeah. And that rear quarter had yeah. some rust in it. Yeah. And uh, inside the wheel arches, the rear wheel arches at the front, those right. two sides okay. were rusted. Okay. Apart from that, uh, the car was That's fine. Yeah. It had a bit of... Um, some of the panels were, weren't the best. Yeah. And we actually replaced that door. Right. And this front guard. Okay. Because they had too many creases in them. <laughs> and the panel beater said to me, he said, look, if you can pick up a, a replacement panel for less than, he said, back in those days, he says, $200. Right. He says, you're better off. He said, because right. by the time I panel beat them out. Yeah. So that's what we did. Okay. And um, along the way, I met a gentleman by the name of Glenn Keenan. Yeah. And we're now really good mates. And what he doesn't know about charges, um, there's no one around that I would know any more than him. Right. And he really helped me okay. with finishing the car to the detail that it is today. Right. And so, I, I owe a lot to him. So you've clearly got to be in your bonnet. This thing's got to look right. Oh, look, It's the funny thing is, what happened is it was meant to be a general restoration. Yes, right? okay. And then Des, to his credit, he rang me up one day and he said, by the way, Phil, he said, I've noticed that the... Um, uh, your guard bolts are different. Right. He said, if we're going to do this right, I want the right ones. And okay. I went, seriously? He said, well, we've got to do it right. So that's that's when it started. Okay. So from that request, we then thought, well, okay, well, if this is what we're going to do, I said, well, what else do you need? Right. And he said, look, there's a few other bits and pieces that aren't right. And that's when I ran into Glenn. And his expertise was just seriously unbelievable. Like he was able to give me the correct colours, the wow. codes, yeah. uh, parts if we needed them. He saw so many parts that were hard to get, especially right. for this particular model. Yeah. So motor and gearbox. Okay, gearbox had been recently rebuilt. Right. Okay. But what we did is we pulled the, the top off it, inspected it, and it was pristine. It okay. was in really cool. good nick. And it was the the guy who sold it to me was legitimate in saying that he had it rebuilt. Yeah. Um, so four speed in these, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And these yeah. were the first four speed. A lot of people ask me why there's a four on the hockey stripe. 
because oh, this was the first okay. four-speed Chrysler yeah. ever made in Australia. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the box is pristine. Yeah. The the diff I haven't touched, but the diff was replaced a few years back, yeah. and it seems there's no whining, no crazy noises, so it seems fine. Um, the engine, okay. The engine initially was given a freshen up. Right. And that's when I learnt my first big lesson. Uh oh. It needed more than that, but I okay. didn't know. Right. So the money I spent doing that was basically down the toilet. Yeah. yeah. Because two months after it was on the road, yeah, it broke a rocker. Oh, bugger. Okay. Yeah. So I took it to a creditable mechanic. He looked at it and he said, Phil, he said, this engine's really sick. I okay. said, you see, are you serious? He said, yep. He says, it's, it needs to be rebuilt. And I said, right. well, I've just spent, back in those days, two grand to get it rebuilt. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we stripped it and totally rebuilt it. Right. Okay. Um, look, I couldn't even tell you the cost, but it was in excess of 20 grand yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Because we went for, try to get original parts back in it right um, the biggest thing but surprisingly enough were the pistons oh, okay we through Glenn yeah I was able to track down a company in America that makes reproduction six-pack pistons oh, really? and the story okay. behind that is that Glenn told me that many many years ago uh, a group of uh, six-pack owners mm. that's what they re these cars were nicknamed six-packs um, because they've got the three triple, uh, three twin throat Webers. Yeah. Um, they got together and they sent a sample piston to the states and said, "Make one up." Right. And put it on file, and okay. they, they got a couple of sets made up, and they actually put a secret code on it, oh. so no one would know what it is. <laughs> now, and the code specifically is it refers to a Holden model. Now, I won't tell you which one. <laughs> So when I had to order the pistons, Glenn said, this is who you contact, and this is the model that you want. And, and I a, said, but hang on, it's a Holden. He says, trust me, this is the one. It's almost a secret handshake, it, isn't it? It was, and, and the pistons are identical reproductions of the originals, right? but they're made in very light uh, alloy. Okay. Um, so uh, we took the original Conrods out and put H-beams in it. Yep. Uh, the original crank was uh, shot pinned and balanced. It's got the twin plate clutch in it, which right. a lot of people take out. When they came from the factory, they had um, three bolt connectors for the whole twin plate clutch system. Right, okay. And a thing they called tongues, and I didn't understand what they were talking about. So when they pulled this one out, they said, hey, this has been modified to six bolts. Right. And it's got three additional tongues in it. And I said, okay. oh. I said, is that good or bad? And he says, actually, that's good. He said, right. because it makes them a lot more solid. Instead of three bolts, you've got six bolts hanging on and the extra tongues. So it's got it's got the original modified clutch uh, clutch housing, but brand new uh, plates. Okay. And the clutch is amazingly light. Right. Okay. But at idle, it rattles like a truck. Okay. It sounds as if something's loose. So when you're sitting in traffic and you hear, you hear all this rattling going on, um, so that was with that, but like I said, the engine was probably the biggest. The carbies were fine, they just had to be rebalanced and cleaned. Right. Um, extractors, that's the next one. What happens with these is the flanges are quite rare. Right. So what they did and what a lot of people did in the day is they cut the flanges off and made new pipes. Okay. So this had new pipes put on it and they were pretty sad. Right. But I didn't know at the time. Yeah. So I had them ceramic coated in white yep. because they look white when you look at them. And after the second rebuild, Glenn said to me, he said, you know, he said, those extractors, he said, like, they got the right flanges, but they do look a bit rough. And I said, well, what can we do? And he says, well, they're making reproduction ones now. Right. Okay. So I bought a set of reproduction ones, yeah. which, mind you, are really hard to get now. Yeah. But they come with a special aluminium coating. Oh. which makes them look white. Okay. So I sold my other set and put these ones on. And during the rebuild process, I made the mechanics wear gloves. Right. White gloves when they put the extractors on. Okay. Because any hand marks left on yeah. them, uh, if there's any grease and you fire it up and they warm up, it stains and that's there forever. Right. And... The most, believe it or not, 
when we had to do the engine rebuild, the most stressful thing for me was not the engine rebuild, but putting the extractors back on. <laughs> and I was actually there watching them and holding them and making oh. sure that they didn't put their greasy mitts on it. The only thing that I've detracted from original is um, the stripes are meant to be a satin, yep. but these are gloss. Okay. I, yep. I wanted them gloss because the car's been cleared. Yep. It's just for maintenance. Yeah, yeah. It's just to yep. keep them clean. Well, I think you're over 18, aren't you? You're oh, allowed, I think allowed so. allowed to make I, these I, decisions. I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> okay. Yes, Mick. Resident workshop bloke, guru, all that sort of thing. Yes. Um, he's going to talk us through uh, broken gaskets. Blowing seals, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Why you shouldn't necessarily panic exactly. when it starts to look ugly under the hood. So yeah. let's go to me. Ladies, gentlemen, bald headed babies, what we're going to talk today about is blown head gasket on your car or not a blown head gasket on your car. There's a, a few things that people worry about when they get what we know was mayonnaise in the sump or water in the oil. Um, and they're immediately on the panic button. Don't. Don't panic. It's not a stress. So there's a couple of things we're going to talk about today. About from the worst to what you think the worst really was. So even V8s are more prone to it than six cylinders. But six cylinders will do it too. Especially the early ones. Some of them have got water running through inlet manifolds and things. And um, modern cars are even more prone to it because of all the extra weak links they've created. So we'll talk about first an actual blown head gasket. I have one here, and this blown head gasket didn't put water in the oil, but what it did do was create a seven cylinder car because it was losing its compression into the inlet system, which was also causing it to be very fumy. So there's a few tests you can do when you first notice that your, your car might be running badly, for instance. So, one of the easiest tests is to find out which cylinder is the one that's playing up. And then developing from there, you know, have, have we got a spark problem? You know, have we got a fuel problem or have we got a compression problem? In this stage, it would have come up as a compression problem. So, a simple test would show that it was down on compression and then you have a look at why, and as we said, we had a, a gasket that was burnt. Now, they burn, um, in this case, because it was a forced inducted motor, um, he hadn't retentioned the cylinder heads when he should have, created the weakness, and the extra pressure burnt it. Nine times out of 10, a head gasket will burn through because at some stage, a car is overheated. And as sure as God made little green apples, if the car has got that hot, we will burn a head gasket. It's just a matter of when, not if. Okay. So you need to be always aware of that. So if you have overheated it, just take it on the chin and it's gonna come. Now, back to that test we were talking about. You can make a simple tool at home if, if you've got the ability. Um, basically what we've got here is an old spark plug, which we've cut off welded a fitting too, so we've got a whole piece of hose fitting to your air compressor or you can go to the extent of purchasing a tool um, I, I don't recommend it for the home mechanic it, it's, it's a huge expense to go to but if you wanted to they are available so what we're going to talk about here is as I said you'll fill the radio out up right to the very top take the radio cap off and remove all the spark plugs um, if you've got somebody to give you a hand, you, you don't need this, but we do this in the workshop because time is money. Um, and what you do is you apply compressed air into the cylinder, which will push the piston to the bottom. But what you do then, if you're on your own, you crank the motor. So you're gonna fight the pressure. What it does, where there's a leak in the system, it will bubble out the radiator. Confirms that you get a blown head gasket. If you don't get bubbles out of the radiator, we don't have a blown head gasket. We get oh. problems somewhere else. And as I reiterate, it could be in the inlet manifold. Yep. It could be in a six cylinder, one of the water pipes that runs under the inlet manifold. 
or behind the water pump there's been some corrosion there and you'll end up with um, water in the oil. So there, there are things to do. Another really old fashioned test, and this was taught to me by my granddad, you know, 50 odd years ago, is get the engine quite hot, right up to running temperature, then turn it off and remove the spark plugs as quick as you can. Steam will come out of the cylinder where the leak is. Pretty simple, but it's confirmation instantly, again, that we do have blind cylinder and gasket, yeah. as to not the blind cylinder and gasket. So th there are things to check to do it. Now, let, let's go into, all right, we have a blind cylinder head gasket, we've got to have some full of mayonnaise, what are we going to do about it? Well, firstly, you can remove the cylinder head and have the, have the head checked and faced, make sure there's no cracks in it, and your gasket, put it all back together. But we've still got a great sump full of goo, which dribbles out like caramel sauce. Don't, don't stress. We, we've touched on this before, there's no such thing as a mechanic in a can. So what we're going to do here is tell you how to get that goo out of your engine. Basically, drain it out, preferably overnight, because it comes out so far. Once it's out, put some plug back in, take that oil filter off, put on a new oil filter, and you're going to put in a mixture of diesel fuel and engine oil 50-50. Pour that into your engine, start your engine up, don't rev it, because watching is quite thin, and if you put load on the bearings you're going to hurt something. Just let it sit there and idle. After about 15 minutes, turn it off, drain it out, another new oil filter, put on your new oil, and nine times out of ten, she's done. Worst case scenario, you might have to do it twice. But it will get rid of all the sun. So don't get involved in all these flushing compounds that are out there. All you're doing is making these people rich because it just doesn't work. And all you'll do is you'll come inside upset, the wife will get upset because you're upset, and she'll tell you the burn the goddamn thing like she's told you a hundred times before. Righto, one of your stories, since we've been on the topic of Mustangs. Yes. This is one we did a few months ago. We did. We had the 2019 Mustang, five litre V8, automatic with a 10 speed auto, and we invited Joe Borg from the Mustang Club along, he has an absolutely gorgeous 67 289 convertible and he had some very very interesting observations to make about the new car yeah we put joe in the first generation new mustang when that came out right all right let's see what they've got to say g'day folks mark higgins here from unique cars magazine i'm with joe borg here joe's the vice president of the victorian mustang owners club That's right. okay. welcome joe thank you very much so what we have is your 1967 convertible and a 2019 model, which we'll get to in a minute. But tell me about your 1967 convertible. The uh, 67 came out of San Jose. Um, we bought it in 2009. Uh, we spent six weeks over there driving it, put it in a container. Yeah, you got it back here, you got the 67 back here, dismantled it. How long did it take to get it to the superb condition it is today? About a year and a half, actually. Okay. It was, um, it was uh, quite a time consuming program, but uh, I, I was fortunate enough, my wife was very understanding, and I spent a lot of time in the garage, and uh, I managed to get it done fairly quickly. We're going from the 1967 Mustang right up to the current one now, 52 years on. Does the new car deserve the Mustang emblem? Yeah, well, it certainly does. It, it, the car is actually quite unique to drive. It, it's got, uh, in particular this one here, it's yeah. got uh, an enormous amount of power, which is very usable, very easy to drive. Yeah. Uh, there's quite a few different uh, modes of settings. Um, and, and one particular thing is the brakes are absolutely sensational. They are so um, precise with the pedal application. The other thing I found that was really, really comfortable, really easy to drive, um, for a car that's such a uh, large body car, there's quite a good viewing area. You can actually see quite a bit out of it, which I thought was quite good. Yeah. Uh, the different sport modes, I, I think you have to sit in the car and, and and read that instruction manual quite a bit to find out how many <laughs> modes it's got. Yeah, it, it is quite complicated. Absolutely. Uh, but mind you, in the, it, it, I can see when you were changing the settings, it's quite easy to change. It, they're, they're very user friendly. It, uh, each control is user friendly. Yeah. Um, the steering is absolutely precise, but 
Uh, my favourite part, of course, is the sport mode. The sport mode was just sensational, the way the transmission operated, the way it actually changed gear, the way it revved. Well, Joe, in America, of course, since 1964, the Americans have been driving the Mustangs. We've had to wait until 2016. You and I both drove that car. Um, and it was sensational, but this new one's a step up again, isn't it? It certainly is. We, when we drove the 2017, um, it was just it was a chalk and cheese compared to the older cars. The way the, the cars handled, the way the response was, the way the engine performance was, was totally, totally different. Yeah. Um, it, it was a, a really nice car to drive. Yes. Uh, it handled extremely well compared to what we've been driving in 2017. Come 2019, this car is completely different. It's, it's almost like it's a completely new platform. Yep. The car is just fantastic. But 2017, mind you, it was fantastic. Great at, car. At, at the, at the year, they're great car. And they're still a great car, don't oh, get absolutely. me wrong. Um, yeah, I think you're, still, you're pretty lucky if you've still got one now. And they, they are reasonably priced second-hand, but, yes. but in saying that, you, you're buying a lot of value for money. There's a lot of value for money for that car. They're, yeah. They're really, really nice. But 2019 at the moment has certainly got me over the edge, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's it's chalk and cheese from mm. the old car, it really is. It's it's just, it's got more power, you know, 339 yeah. kilowatts. It's got a 10 speed auto. That, that's, um, that's what I like. You know, the 10 speed auto is really good. That's in fact, fantastic. it's better than the manual, I yeah. think. And I, I like driving manuals, but I think the auto is better again. And I like the way now that they, they gave the suspension a big tweak because the 2017, particularly in the rain, had a tendency to flick to the bum out a bit and be a bit twitchy and all the rest. That is totally different in the way it rides and handles and it gives you a lot more confidence when you want to have a bit of a crack down a bit of a winding road, which let's face it, that's yeah, brilliant at doing that. It's made for it's it, isn't it? it yeah. Well it's sat in a drag strip yeah. and it has a drag strip <laughs> mode as we found out. That was, that was the other thing. Yeah. The drag strip mode is good. The traction control is fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, going the corner at, at, a, at a reasonably good pace it still sits really well and you can accelerate out of the corner yeah. and it actually just simply squats and takes off. It really feels very, very sure-footed. It, yeah. it feels really nice. Yeah, it, it does. does feel nice. It does for sure. You know, it's, it's no wonder that the car is the biggest selling sports car in Australia and they've sold 22,000 since January 2016 when they launched it here. You know, that's not bad yeah, in a small market like is, Australia. You know, there's always been a way. I mean, the people are buying them, are waiting a year for their cars. So yeah. Obviously, there was a market for it. Well, yeah. <laughs> they, they, and they waited. <laughs> they did. Well, we waited 52 years, yeah, really, right, when you yeah. think about it. Uh, and in America, I know in 64, when they launched it in New York at the World Trade Fair, yeah. Ford expected the sales of 100,000 units in year one. Yeah. They got 22,000 units sold day one. Day one yeah. Within two years, they'd sold a million cars. That's right. So they kind of went, oh, yeah. what do we do now? Yeah. So I, my understanding is every Ford factory yeah. kind of stopped making everything else and started making yeah. Mustangs. Yeah. Yeah. And it turned the company around because they were in the deep fertiliser with the Edsel. And the, and the board were like, oh, yeah. do we take another chance? But Lee Iacocca, okay. yeah, thank goodness for him. Yeah. We've got to do it, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. Well, and he did. Yeah. And there's a result. Well. Right, well that's just about it from us. Now we've uh, got a new issue coming out. We've got all sorts of videos sitting on the bench waiting to be cut. Renault Alpine, yes. old and new, old and uh, is one of the one of the really interesting ones coming up. But anyway, it's in this Euro Bio Guide coming out when? 10th of October. 10th of October, good. It's a massive issue, a huge amount of work's gone into it with the buyer's guide, market valuations and all this for British cars and European cars. And you also get to see if you agree or disagree with our choices from mm. what we put in our sheds oh, yes. of British cars and European oh, cars. Yes. Yes. So it's uh, so if you are interested or you have a British or European car, go and grab this one because it has everything you need to know about it. See you next time, folks.